Good evening, Year 11, and welcome to your night before the physics exam revision session. For tonight, we are going to be taking a look at the ripple tank practical, velocity time graphs, magnetic fields, and if you are doing the higher tier paper, we'll also be taking a look at the motor effect. So, starting with the ripple tank practical. This is one of the required practicals you would have seen way back at the beginning of year 11, and no doubt we'll see again in a revision session in the future. Now, we use this particular setup of equipment to measure the speed of a water wave. So the equipment consists of a glass bottomed tank attached to a vibrating bar, which has a small depth of water in it. Uh, the glass bottom tank obviously then is able to project a shadow down onto the screen underneath and we quite often put a piece of white paper underneath there as well as a ruler for taking measurements from. There is a light source suspended above in order to illuminate the wave fronts as they travel along. Now, in order to calculate the speed of a wave, you need to know its wavelength and its frequency. And we can get both of those pieces of information using the apparatus as shown here. So, first of all, uh, the way it works. The vibrating bar is attached to a, uh, an electric power supply and there's a little motor there which causes it to vibrate. That pushes on the surface of the water, so it's very important that that bar is held just a millimetre or so above the surface of the water. That is what then creates the wave which travels across the tank. And as you can see from the diagram here, you can see the shadow of the wave fronts moving across the screen. So this arrangement works really, really well for showing those waves. In order to measure the wavelength of one wave, it is much more accurate to measure the wavelength of several waves and then divide by the number of waves that you've got in order to take an average. Now, there are a couple of ways of doing this. One, as you can see here, is to place a ruler um, underneath the ripple tank on the white piece of paper, line up the zero end with one wave front and see how many waves you can record going to as a bigger distance as your ruler allows. If you've got a 30 centimetre ruler, even better. However, these waves do tend to flicker a little bit. So to make it even more accurate, what we recommend you do for this, and if you're asked for a method in an exam question, is once you've got the ruler in position, is to take a photograph using your camera uh, on your phone is perfectly acceptable as a way of demonstrating uh, how to calculate the wavelength for this experiment. So if you take a little snapshot like we've done here um, with the ruler going across several wave fronts, what you can then do is pick a point where a wave front crosses a nice easy to read value on your ruler. In this case, you can see there's one at the zero and then go for one as far away as you possibly can, where again, it crosses a nice, easy to read number. In this case, there's one exactly on 15 centimetres. That might not be the case for everybody. Now, once you know that, you know the distance then for several waves. All you then have to do is count up how many waves there are between your first mark and your second mark. And in this case, there are seven waves going from the zero to the 15. Uh, we know the distance for those seven waves is 15 centimetres. Therefore, the wavelength of one wave is 15 divided by seven, which is 2.1 centimetres. And that will give us um, a value for the wavelength. Moving on to calculate the frequency, the frequency is a little more tricky because the wave fronts are generally moving very rapidly and usually um, a little too fast for the eye to see. They can be adjusted to a relatively low value, but that 
has the knock-on effect of then sometimes causing the vibrating bar to stop moving. So we always need to have it at a reasonably fast speed, but that just makes it tricky for observing visually. However, again, we can, for this one, we can use your mobile phone and we can use the video camera function. Now, in order to make sure that you have got accurate timings for this, it's really important to include the timer in the shot of the picture. So it doesn't matter if it's smack bang in the middle like here or if it's off to one side, as long as you can see it. And then you just need to pick a point. You might want to mark it with a little with a pen or an arrow, as I've done here. And you're going to observe how many wavefronts pass that point. But you're not going to do it directly. What you are going to do is to film that uh, arrangement focusing on that particular point for about 10 seconds. Once you've done that, stop your timer and then re-watch the video in slow motion. And because you've got the timer included in the shot, you'll be able to see exactly when the 10 seconds are up. So you count the number of wave fronts that move past in 10 seconds, and that will give you the number of waves in 10 seconds. And then to work out the frequency, you just need to know how many came past in one second. So you take your number you've just counted and you divide it by 10. You now have two values that you need in order to calculate your wave speed. And the equation you need to use for this one, wave speed is equal to frequency times wavelength. You've got your frequency calculations from previously. You've got your wavelength calculation from previously. And when you multiply those two together, that will give you your wave speed and that will give it to you in centimeters per second. However, if you want uh, meters per second or if the question asks for meters per second, you just take your value and divide it by 100 and that's the conversion for meters. Moving on then to velocity time graph. Uh, not to be confused with distance time graphs, which look very, very similar. So please check the y-axis, the vertical axis on the left-hand side of the diagram. And as you can see, this one says velocity in meters per second. A distance time graph would say distance. But they do look very similar in terms of their shape. Now, some important features you need to be aware of on a velocity time graph. Firstly, any straight diagonal line going up and to the right, like the one highlighted here, represents an object moving with constant acceleration. Any horizontal lines represent constant velocity. Now, if an object is not moving at all, that line will be obviously horizontal, but following along on the x-axis for the value v equals zero. And finally, the other type of line you can see here is the straight diagonal line going downwards, and that represents constant deceleration. So the object is slowing down. Now, the first thing you could be asked to do using one of these graphs is to calculate a value for acceleration. And the acceleration is found using the equation Acceleration is equal to the change in velocity, the delta V you can see there, divided by the time taken for that change. So the information can be taken directly from the graph. What you need to know is the velocity at the beginning of the period you're looking for, the velocity at the end. Then you can work out the change and then divide it by how long it took. So in this case, for our first diagonal line, at the start, the velocity is zero. At the end, the velocity is seven meters per second, and it took four seconds for that change to occur. That's the distance, the difference in the X values for those two points. So our acceleration is then seven, which is our change in velocity, because we started from zero divided by the four seconds, and that gives us a value of 1.75. Importantly, you also need to make sure you include the units and the units for acceleration are meters per second squared. Also sometimes called meters per second per second. Slightly different from velocity, which is just meters per second. If you are doing Hyatt here, 
one of the other things you can be asked to do with a velocity time graph is to work out the distance traveled. Now, because of the axes on this graph being velocity and time, velocity multiplied by time is equal to distance. And so the area underneath the graph represents the distance traveled. If you know the trapezium rule, um, then you can work out the area of that shape because it is a trapezium. However, in not every case it will be a simple trapezium. And so the best way to do this type of uh, calculation is to break the shape down into a simple, com a simpler combination of shapes as you possibly can. And I would recommend rectangles and triangles because the uh, calculation for working out the areas of rectangles and triangles is something you should be very, very familiar with from maths. So triangles is a half base times height. Rectangles and squares are just base times height. So for section A here, we've got a triangle. Uh, so there's our half. Our X component, our base is four seconds. The height of it is seven meters per second. So if we multiply all those together, that will give us a distance traveled in section A of 14 meters. If we do the same for section B, that is a three by seven rectangle. So that is 21 meters. And finally, area C, we've got another triangle. So a half times two times seven gives us seven meters. And if we add all of those different sections together, that will give us the total distance traveled of 42 meters. Moving on for everybody with magnetic fields. Uh, so you should be familiar with the idea of a bar magnet, as you can see from the diagram here, and that magnets have poles. And magnets always have two poles, and we call those poles the North Pole and the South Pole. And when we're drawing a magnet and we want to show the magnetic field, we always draw magnetic field lines that loop around from one pole of the magnet to the other. You'll notice that the lines have arrows on them as well. The magnetic field lines show the strength of the magnetic field and they show the direction of the magnetic field. The direction always runs from north to south. So if you're ever asked to label a magnetic field diagram, you just need to make sure you've put a couple of arrows on it to show they are running from the north to the south. You don't need to do too many. Two or three arrows is completely sufficient as long as you make sure they're all pointing in the same direction. In terms of the strength of the magnetic field, the magnetic field is always strongest at the poles. And you can see this from the diagram because this is where the magnetic field lines are closest together. Uh, so as you move away from the magnet, you can see here the magnetic field lines are moving further away from each other. That indicates the magnetic field is getting weaker. Now, this is a permanent magnet. So this is something that is always magnetic. You may also be asked about the magnetic field of devices that are not always magnetic. First of those is the solenoid. The solenoid is a coil of wire that is carrying an electric current, and solenoid is the name we give to it. And as you can see from the magnetic field here, it is a very, very similar shape to a bar magnet. It has a pole at either end, and the magnetic field lines loop around. Now, inside the coils, you can see all of the lines are close together and they are running parallel to each other. That indicates that the magnetic field inside of that coil is very strong and it is uniform. So it doesn't matter where you are inside that coil, the magnetic field that you experience will be the same. Now, unlike a permanent magnet, magnets like this can have their strength varied. You can make them weaker, you can make them stronger. So in the case of a solenoid, you can increase the strength of its magnetic field by increasing the current that's running through it or by increasing the number of coils you have in the coil. So making the coil longer, making it out of more coils of wire. You can also make the magnetic field stronger by having a bigger area for your coils. Uh, but that is something which we don't actually usually study at GCSE, but future information if you're thinking about taking A-level physics. Now, 
if we take our solenoid, our coil of wire, and we insert into it a piece of iron or a piece of steel in the form of a bar or a rod, which is known as a core, then what we can do is turn our solenoid into a device called an electromagnet. An electromagnet is much stronger than a solenoid because the piece of iron or steel that's inside of it also becomes magnetized and that increases the strength of the magnetic field. And similarly to the solenoid, we can make our electromagnet stronger by increasing the current or increasing the number of coils of wire that are around the iron core. We can also use a thicker wire because that lowers the resistance, which therefore allows more current to flow. Uh, one of the advantages of an electromagnet as opposed to a permanent magnet is that we can also change the direction of its magnetic field by just reversing the direction the current is flowing through the coil. And the other advantages of electromagnets are that you can actually switch them on and off, which is something that you can't do with a permanent magnet, which makes them very useful for applications such as scrap yards and recycling facilities, where you could use them to sort out different metals. And finally, for those of you that are doing higher tier, uh, I'm going to have just a quick recap on the motor effect. Now, this is something you need to be aware of. Uh, it does come up occasionally in exam questions. And again, if you stay on to do A-level physics, it comes up in a lot more detail. So uh, for this, you will need your left hand, as you can see from the diagram here. So when you have a current carrying wire and it is placed in a magnetic field so that the current is perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field, that piece of wire experiences a force. And that force is perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the current. And using Fleming's left hand rule here, if you align your fingers, as you can see there, uh, you, can, you can work out which direction the force will be based on the direction of the magnetic field and the direction of the current. Now, the only little caveat with this one is that the direction of the current is the direction of the conventional current, which is considered to be from positive to negative, rather than the direction of the electron flow, which goes from negative to positive. So when you look at a circuit diagram that shows the motor effect in action, if you look for the little plus symbol on the battery, that's the long side, that way, then you'll be able to see which way the current, the conventional current, is moving around the circuit. And then you just have to orientate your fingers whilst keeping them perpendicular to each other to work out the direction that the force is being experienced. Moving on from there, we can also then calculate the size of the force using this equation here. F equals bill, or B times I times L. And again, if you're asked to do calculations, as always, we would expect you to use the every method. And if you notice on the diagram here, the positive on the battery is clearly labeled. So you can see which way the conventional current is flowing through the diagram. In this case, it's from the back to the front. Now, these quantities that we need here, uh, the force that you're gonna be asked to calculate will be in newtons because that is the standard unit of force. The magnetic field strength, given the symbol B, also known as the magnetic flux density, is measured in teslas. The current through the wire is measured in amps. And for the length of the wire, it is only the length of the wire that is enclosed within the magnetic field. So it may not be the entire length of wire. Now, all of these values could be given in things such as milli or kilo or even micro depending on the sizes involved and so there may be some need to convert to the standard base units you might also be told the force and two of those three things and need to rearrange the equation to find the third one as always use your every method multiply out the bits that you can before you do any rearranging and you'll be able to calculate an answer and finally, 
the motor effect as applied to an electric motor. So as you can see here, we have a coil of wire connected to a circuit. Uh, that coil is able to rotate about the central axis and it's placed inside the magnetic field, as you can see here, of a U-shaped magnet. It doesn't have to be that particular shape. This example just is. Notice the battery is clearly labelled and you can see which end is the positive. Now, as a result of this arrangement, when the switch is closed, a current flows around the wire, but the current is flowing in opposing directions. So on the right hand side, it's moving towards the back. On the left hand side, it's moving towards the front. If you apply the left hand rule to this, you'll notice that that means that the forces that creates are in opposite directions. And that causes the coil of wire to start to rotate. And it will rotate from the position it's in towards the vertical position. Now, when it gets to the vertical position, there is a gap. If you look on the diagram there, you can see a device called a split ring commutator. It's colored in green and orange. And there is a gap between the two sections because if there wasn't a gap, when the wire rotated through 90 degrees and got to the vertical section, the two forces would be acting in completely opposite directions, uh, directly above each other, and then the coil would actually stop spinning. So the split ring commutator allows for a break in the circuit so that very, very briefly, there is no current flowing through the coil and no forces being experienced. As a result of that, the coil will continue to rotate. Its momentum will just carry it forwards just across that brief little gap until the circuit can reconnect and the current can flow again. Now, having changed sides on the commutator, the direction of the current in each half of the coil is now in the opposite direction to it was previously. And that means the force is now in the opposite direction as well, and that will allow the motor to keep on spinning. And every half revolution, it reaches that gap again. There's a brief pause in the current, which allows the coil to swap sides. And then when it reconnects, it just keeps pushing the motor around and around and around, spinning in the same direction every time. So you could be asked to describe that in a qualitative way. OK, that's it for tonight's revision session. Uh, good luck with your exams tomorrow and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much.